My name is Jeff Baum. I'm the Managing Director of the Center on Communication Leadership, and I'm delighted that uh, the Dean invited us to organize the Loper Lecture this year on behalf of the uh, Dean Wilson and the school. We're honored by all the students and faculty and communities and friends with us today, and I wanted to recognize a few folks who are here. Specifically, first off, I want everybody to say hello to H. Russell Smith, with, who made this all possible and is responsible for establishing the Loper Lecture. <laughs> From the public television community, we have Mel Rogers, the president of KOCE. There's Mel. I know Al Jerome is on his way, but I know there's others from KCET here. So if there are other folks from KCET here, could you stand and be recognized? KCET. Winter Horton is joining us today. He's a former member of the CPB board and one of, a co-founder of KCET. Winter. From the campus community, we have our vice president for vice provost for globalization and the former general manager of WHUT in Washington, D.C., Adam Clayton Powell III. <laughs> My colleague and the director of our School of Communication and a professor of communication, Dr. Larry Gross. Another colleague, our, our newest addition to the leadership ranks of the Annenberg School, the director of our School of Journalism, the uh, Geneva Overholzer, respected journalist. <laughs> but first and foremost, we want, also want to acknowledge the honorary chairman of the Loper Lecture Series, Dr. James L. Loper and his wife Mary Lou, who are with us here today. It's a special treat for me to, uh, to be able to bring Brian Lamb to USC because before I worked for Jeff Cowan and Ernie Wilson, I worked for Brian Lamb. And working for C-SPAN about six months after I graduated from USC with my master's degree in journalism was one of the most fortunate breaks I ever had in my professional career. Uh, working with Brian was a, a true privilege. He was a founder of an institution. And you don't often get a chance to meet somebody who is actually the founder of an institution and talk about, learn from the source what it was like to get something started. Brian was the person who was ex uh, exactly as you've seen him on the air, completely without airs. He, has, he was more interested in, in taking the information that we saw and we could show in Washington and, and sharing it with the public outside the Beltway. He was much more concerned with folks outside the Beltway. And then as an employee of his, he was much more concerned about us as individuals and our welfare. Brian would actually have a legendary lamb lunch with every uh, employee that uh, every Thursday we would, uh, he would go out and everybody from every, every part of the co uh, company would have a chance to talk to Brian and share uh, their thoughts, their insights. And, and it wasn't about Brian telling us where he wanted to take the company. He would ask us where we thought uh, about the company and what we think uh, C-SPAN could do to improve others, and then just more about where you're from, where did you go to high school, what, what city did you come from. It's kind of like being on, on Brian's programs, <laughs> if you've ever been on uh, book notes or, some, or anything like that. Um, and with Brian, I got the opportunity to do, uh, have a front row seat at, at uh, some amazing uh, opportunities during the 92 and the 90 cam uh, midterm campaigns and the 2000 presidential election. And it's, uh, it's just fills me with a lot of pride to be able to show Brian what's going on here at C-SPAN, at, at USC now, <laughs> and also to uh, share Brian's uh, insights on to the national media scene uh, here with the, uh, the Annenberg School and our friends and alumni and supporters. But to get the program started, I want to introduce my, my new CEO, the uh, Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication, the longest serving member of the Board of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, our Dean Ernest J. Wilson III, who's here just back from Washington, is going to give us some insights as to what's going on. I was telling uh, Brian earlier, I said, uh, I don't know what you did with Jeff Baum, but it sure did work. <laughs> because he has been a remarkable colleague. Uh, he shares many of the characteristics that he ascribed to you, Brian. Uh, he is someone delightful to work with, very sharp, knows how to make things happen, and does so in a way that's completely collegial. 
So I want to thank Jeff for his good work. And Brian, I want to thank you for helping to produce the Jeff that is doing the good work. Um, as uh, Jeff Baum just said, I returned uh, last night from Washington, D.C. Uh, I was attending a board meeting of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, which was one of the most exciting and positive meetings that I have attended of, the, uh, of that board in eight years. But I, I first want to say, uh, for those of you who haven't been recently or since the election, Washington is a very exciting town right now, as you might imagine. Uh, there's excitement in the air, that you feel the innovation. The only thing that topped it was that year, I remember, when the Redskins won the Super Bowl. <laughs> so that, it's almost that good. Um, but for those of us who are interested in media, especially those of us who are interested in what my new colleague Geneva Overholzer calls information in the public interest, information in the public interest, this is a very exciting time to be there. And I, I have to admit, I'm somewhat partisan. Let, let me preface this by saying, however, if you go to the Annenberg site, uh, you will see that our colleagues have put together um, an agenda that describes the McCain policy toward media and telecommunications and so forth, and then uh, his opponent's positions, Obama. So I, in a nonpartisan way, I do urge you to do that. But I now have to admit that I did work a little bit on the Obama campaign uh, on some of these issues. And I simply urge all of you to go to change.gov and look at the agenda for action and think about the way that it impacts upon public interest media. And it says something I think that's very telling and that has been a bit of a guide for me as the new dean at this school and I think should be a guide for all of us. It is not so much which tools you use, but how do you employ all of these different tools to empower people? So it doesn't make any difference if it's a flip camera or email or a traditional legacy radio. How can American citizens begin to use these new tools and the legacy tools to create a better America, to create a stronger democracy, to create a more competitive uh, and compassionate United States of America on the world scene. Um, this is an issue, as you know, and, and, and the, the lectures that I've been privileged to attend in the past, the Loper lectures, have all addressed this theme. What is the unique role of public broadcasting? What do we do that the commercial media cannot do or will not do? How do we contribute to citizenship? How do we contribute to civil public discourse? How do we educate the young? How do we make our culture richer? So this is a wonderful uh, opportunity, I think, for all of us over the past several years to get together to talk about what is coming to be called public media, public service media, because it's not just broadcasting anymore, of course. It's online, it's blogs, etc. cetera. Um, we here at the Annenberg School, therefore, take special pride in this annual lecture. Um, my predecessor, Jeffrey Cowan, who helped to uh, establish this and worked so hard to make it happen, himself worked in public broadcasting at the international level. Uh, we have graduate students who are terribly interested in this. And I, let me make a bit of a pitch here, just to ask your th thoughts about this. By my count, there is not a single program in the journalism school in the United States of America that has a program devoted entirely to public service media. Not a single one to recruit young people in that they don't have to go. I mean, CBS is fine, NBC is fine, but they don't have to do that. How do you get mid-career training? How do we articulate a vision for public broadcasting that can serve the challenges and meet the challenges of our new century? So I, I would like all of us to think a bit on what ideas we might come up with. Maybe it's a network of interested journalism schools. Maybe there are alliances between local TV and radio stations and communication and journalism schools. But I simply want to um, 
uh, close my, my brief remarks by saying that the challenge to public broadcasting is too important to leave it alone. We have got to be engaged with that, and that means bringing the next generation along, the kind of pe wonderful young people that we train here at the Annenberg School. So I hope that we can give some thought to that, perhaps over lunch. Uh, feel free to send emails to me or Jeff or others, um, and we will steal as many of your ideas as you're willing to share with us. Thank you very much. I would now like to uh, invite Jeff Cowan to come to the... Okay, so I'm... See, this guy is so good. So please enjoy your lunch. Please and enjoy your lunch. Turn to Jeff Bob. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, Jeff Cowan will be back to moderate the rest of the program. So if I could ask you all to uh, pause for a moment during your, your wonderful meals. We have a very special guest here to introduce Brian Lamb, somebody who's been on his program often. If you don't listen to Tavis Smiley on the radio, you certainly watch him on television. He also gives internships to a lot of our own students. He's written 11 books. He worked for Tom Bradley. Um, he was the good Bradley effect. And, and uh, Tavis, among his many things, uh, his name uh, resides at a school of communication in Texas Southern uh, where he continues to inspire so many students. And it's really, Tavis, a great pleasure to have you here to welcome Brian Lamb. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, first of all, to Jeffrey Cowan and to the dean. I'm trying to see where people are. Dean Wilson, where, there you are. The dean and to all of the uh, faculty, administration, staff, students who are here, thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to drop by here and to uh, see my friend Adam Powell uh, to, to uh, introduce um, a fellow Hoosier. Uh, we actually should not be friends because he went to Purdue and I went to Indiana. Um, that's kind of like USC and that other school across town. It's, a, it's a, an intense rivalry, so we really should not uh, be friends um, in Indiana. My two favorite teams are Indiana and whoever is playing Purdue. Um, uh, so that uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be friends. And uh, when you consider that we uh, grew up, uh, Brian's just a couple of years older than I am, uh, but uh, we grew up literally just down the road from each other. He in a place called Lafayette, where Purdue is in West Lafayette, and I in a little place called Kokomo, just uh, literally about 25 minutes down the road. Uh, my mother, as a matter of fact, um, uh, goes to a church in Lafayette, so she drives uh, two or three times a week from Kokomo to Lafayette to, to attend a church there. So whenever I go home, as I will be in a couple hours, a couple days, I guess, for Thanksgiving, I'm sure I'll be in Lafayette in just a few days at church with my mama um, right around Thanksgiving time. Uh, but when I, I got, the, got the call from, um, from my dear friend Jeffrey Kahn, who I so admire and so revere and so respect, uh, when I received word that, that Brian was going to be in town, um, and they asked me to, to come by. I was able to move some things around from the, on the radio and TV schedule because it is my, my sincere honor um, to, uh, to have the opportunity to say a few words about, about Brian Lamps. I, again, want to thank you for having the wisdom uh, to have him here on this great campus, uh, and, to, uh, and I'm excited to take a seat and hear what, what Brian has to share with us today. Uh, I was thinking yesterday uh, in a conversation um, for one of our TV shows. Uh, as a matter of fact, Tony Morrison was on our, our show last night. And Tony and I were talking off camera last night um, about this notion of vision, about vision. Uh, and in the little church that I grew up in in Indiana, which I'll be back in, as I said, uh, a few days from now, there's a Bible verse that uh, I am fond of and, and recall learning as a child <clears throat> that says very simply, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And we live in a world, certainly now more than ever, where we have to have leaders who are visionary, who can see things uh, that are not as though they were, uh, who can implement ideas and, and advance the cause uh, of justice and freedom in this country in ways that the rest of us hadn't really considered. Uh, I believe uh, in, more than anything else, truth. For me, truth and freedom are pretty much the same thing. Truth and freedom are inseparable for me. And I regard what Brian Lamb has done uh, for almost 30 years now, I regard what he has done at C-SPAN is nothing less uh, than helping us to embrace uh, and to revel in the freedoms that we have, starting with what it means to tell the American people the truth in an unfiltered, uncensored, unbiased way, to tell the American people the truth. And if C-SPAN stands for anything, C-SPAN 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and C-SPAN radio and 
If C-SPAN stands for anything, for me, it really stands for telling people the truth. And as is so often the case in times of, how might I put this, Dr. King used to say that the ultimate measure of a people is not where they stand in times of comfort and convenience, but where they stand in times of controversy and challenge. And in these times of controversy and challenge, the first casualty is most often the truth. And so I value, as I get older, what it means to tell people the truth more than anything else in an unbiased, again, unfiltered and uncensored way. So that when you get a chance to tune in C-SPAN now for almost 30 years, you get a chance to hear people engage in telling the truth as they see it. And how Brian has gone for all these years without anybody having a clue as to what his politics are, I do not know. Uh, but he's done a remarkable job of, of establishing uh, a standard and giving us a network or a, a number of networks now that really engage in telling people the truth. I have a very simple um, but I think uh, poignant definition, at least as I see it. Maybe that's just my own ego getting in the way. Uh, but my definition of, of leadership is this. Uh, leadership for me means that you can't lead people unless you love people. And you can't save people unless you serve people. That's my definition of leadership. You can't lead folk if you don't love folk, and you can't save folk if you don't serve folk. And so the questions that each of us who fancies ourselves as a leader, and Brian certainly is, uh, if we are leaders, we have to wrestle, I think, with those questions all the time. What is the depth of my love for the American people? And what is the quality of my service to them? It is clear to me that the depth of his love for the American people uh, is unquestioned because the quality of his service to the American people through these networks that he has given us uh, is, uh, is premium. And so it is my distinct honor to introduce to you here in Southern California uh, my fellow Hoosier, uh, the creator of C-SPAN, Brian Lamb. time I uh, have an opportunity to interview Tavis on the air, I ask, ask him if he's gotten married yet. <laughs> Tavis? Tavis, I have a question for you. Have you gotten married yet? Okay. <laughs> I asked for 20 years that question of Christopher Hitchens if he was still a socialist. And every time he'd come on, he'd say, well, you're going to ask me? And I did. And he said, no, I'm not a socialist any longer. So someday. Next year. Next year. Next year? Okay. <clears throat> the, the good news. <clears throat> First of all, I've never heard a bigger bunch of baloney in all my life, especially from Jeff, not Jeff Cowan, uh, Baum. Where are you, Jeffrey? There in the back. Um, Tavis, thanks for coming over today. Uh, the good news is uh, I don't have a prepared uh, message for you. Um, I, I happened to get online last night and saw the Mary Bitterman speech from uh, 2005, and it, it was great, but it was all prepared, and she had these you know, the whole thing, and I thought they're going to be disappointed if I don't have a prepared speech. But I, I tell you, I, I can't do it. I have not written a speech since my college graduation. Uh, I can't read a speech. Uh, I just have to visit. And very quickly in this process, I want to get some dialogue going back and forth. I see a lot of very familiar faces, people that I've interviewed before. Kay Mills is here. Uh, we met years and years ago when she was with the L.A. Times, and I chatted with her. I haven't seen her for a lot of years. Dick Block, who I don't know. God knows Dick. Are you still here? Where are you? There you are. How many years? 35, 40 years? Jim Loper, and I, I have not seen Jim Loper, I think, since 1972. And uh, in my early world in Washington, I worked for a Democrat, Lyndon Johnson, and then I worked for Richard Nixon. And I've never been a member of a party. And if you ever saw how I voted, you'd say that's a tad bit weird. Uh, there's never been a, I've never pulled the lever for one side or the other. Um, my grandmother was a Democrat. My grandfather was a Republican on my father's side. And I've searched all my life to figure out why I became nothing. Um, I think it works. Uh, one of the great thrills for me has been, and we stumbled into it when Tavis started the Tavis Smiley Presents. Uh, years ago, 10, 10 years ago. <clears throat> and if you've never seen one of these days, you ought to do what I've done. And as a little white guy from Lafayette, Indiana, where we had very few people of other colors, 
It is the greatest experience to sit for a full day. In the morning, he has 14 people on the stage. In the afternoon, he has 14 people on the stage. And this thing just moves. And you get an insight to another world, if you're like me, that you'll never get anywhere else. And we're going to do it again this year, <clears throat> next year. What is it, Fe uh, April? February 28th. February 28th. And where's this one going to be? Great. But that's probably been, for me, the, the greatest experience of being a part of C-SPAN for 30 years. Um, let me just, I guess the best thing to do is to try to put it in perspective. Uh, Jeff, when he first called me, said, we want to talk a little bit about the future and where this is going. I think I can safely tell you that I have no idea where it's going. Um, I, I, knew where I, I knew where it was going 30 years ago. It seemed right. And I'm sure Jim Loper and Winter, uh, when they started KCET years ago, they knew where it was going. They felt it in their bones. They're, they got up every day, hit the ground running, got very excited about it, knew they were going to change the face of American television. And they did. And it's still here. Uh, I was motivated primarily by the power thing. I didn't like, I don't like power. I don't want it. Uh, I've never had it. Um, I will easily walk away from this thing when it's over, uh, comfortable not uh, having it. <clears throat> and um, I've watched it for 43 years since I've been in Washington. And I just don't, never liked it. I, I, I didn't like initially the fact that we had three commercial television networks all based on 6th Avenue in New York City. All had an evening newscast, used to be 15 minutes long. Uh, black and white went to half hour. And if you can still do it to this day, and this is not, it's not criticism, it's observation. They have the same stories. They have the commercial breaks at the same time. They get to the health stories about geezers like me about uh, 20 minutes into the evening newscast. It's been that way forever, and they're all competent, and uh, they, they know what they're doing in that world. But I lived in Washington, and I would go back to Indiana all the time, and I would, I still do, and I see my friends back there, and I would say, here's what I saw. And they would say, tell me more, and they were very interested. And as it evolved, uh, I was a, a writer for Cablevision magazine, and I met a fellow by the name of Bob Tisch. And Bob Tisch wanted me to go to work for him. And um, he didn't know much about me, but he wanted to beef up his Washington office. And I said, well, I really want to get into this cable television thing and into programming and into public affairs. And he said, come to work for me, and I will make it happen for you. And I couldn't believe it because nobody had ever said that. Most people said, you're nuts. If you think, I mean, I, I worked for a guy who was a wonderful guy, Dick Shively, at the Channel 18 in Lafayette, Indiana. And Dick Shively said to me when I was working for him, if you program this television station based on your tastes, we're out of business. <laughs> and he was right. He had a UHF television station. You ever heard of that, Jim? A <clears throat> UHF television station. And so Bob said, I'll, I'll help you make this happen. And I, I, I went to work for him. And he said, I'll give you a column in my magazine. Put your picture in there. People will know who you are in the business. And he raised a measly $15,000 to buy a little DXC 1600, 1600 camera, a Sony camera, and a tape machine. And we would go around from member to member and record an interview with them and ship them out by an airplane or UPS ground uh, to the cable system, and it would be put on that cable system. It was that unsophisticated. That was where we started. And then one day I was invited to come to a room not smaller than this, and there were 40 cable television operators in the room. They owned cable systems. It was in the very early days. And I stood up and clumsily pitched the idea of public affairs programming on cable. They didn't need it. They didn't have it. They didn't care. Uh, it just wasn't in their vision. They were doing home box office at the time and showtime. There were only five networks. One of them was called Madison Square Garden Network, and they did one sporting event a night. And there was something called WYAH, Channel 27, in Portsmouth, Virginia. Anybody in the room know what that is today? Well, it turned out to be the 700 Club and Pat Robertson. 
And the other one was Channel 17. Some guy that was on the campus this week, uh, some guy named Turner, ha had a television station 24 hours a day. And it, he did news in the middle of the night. And a guy sat there with a bag over his head with the eyes clipped out. And it was all meant to be silly and funny. That's how it started. And when I got in this room, I made the pitch. And after the room was over, everybody, you know, it really, they're nice guys. But they all kind of tapped me on the head, nice little guy. And, <clears throat> you know, nice idea. And I had had about 100 no's before I got to that room. One guy and his sidekick, Bob Rosencrantz and King Gunner. And I always love this story because Bob Rosencrantz is relatively short, bald, Jewish, and liberal. Ken Gunner is tall, full head of hair, right wing John Burt Society, former member in those old days, and a Presbyterian. And these guys came together and said, we think we can make this work. That's really the Bob Tisch and the Bob Rosencrantz things and how the whole thing started. It's a pyramid scheme, by the way. Bob said, here's a check. It took a while. It took Ken Gunner to squeeze it out of his hand. But here's a check for $25,000. Take my name, our name, and go around and see if anybody else will buy off on this. And so I did. I'd gotten all these no's, <clears throat> but I went back to all these people and said, Bob Rosencrantz gave me a check for $25,000. How about you? The second one to fall was um, the gentleman named Russ Carp, who was with TCI. No, it wasn't TCI. It was a teleprompter in New York City. And he said to me, I had no idea he had a political bone in his body. He said to me, I'll do that. And if we'd have had that before the Vietnam War started, maybe we wouldn't have had a war. Now, that's probably not the case, but it didn't matter. He was motivated for that reason. And there were every, all the rest of them, there were a whole bunch of them, John Evans and John Seaman, and I can go on and on naming all these people that came around. That's how it started in an environment, by the way, at the time where everybody in broadcasting thought cable was never going to happen. And it wouldn't work. And nobody will watch it. Uh, and my reaction to that was, if you keep your costs down, you got a shot at it. I'm going to give you a statistic that will put it in perspective, a couple of them. The reason why we've lasted for, and that's what it is, lasted for 30 years, uh, besides the tremendous support we've gotten from our business. If you add up every single penny that I have personally made in the last 30 years, it does not equal the salary for one year of any anchorman on any commercial television network. And I am overpaid. This business is overpaid. I have been perfectly happy and very happy and don't want another dime from them. But that's the way we got there. There's another statistic that will go directly to the industry that you're all involved in. We take in every year and spend this double the amount of money that the Jim Lehrer show costs. His show costs roughly, if the published figures are correct, $28 million a year. We basically spend about $56 million a year. And we do it with 270 employees. We do C-SPAN 1, 2, and 3, a radio station, and 12 websites. And that's because everybody involved in it understands what we are. And, and that's the different world we live in today, is that you have this entity here that really doesn't want to be anything but what it is. It's tough, though, because you live in a world that is commercial. You live in a world that at CNN that has $1.1 billion, the latest figures of how much money it collected last year to do its job. And so you're constantly being compared. People that work inside our organization always say, well, what about those other guys? And I have to keep saying, and it's even tough for me to say, but we're not in that business. We're not supposed to do that. We're in the business of doing the Tavis Smiley Presents kind of thing. And Tim Naftali, who's here from the Nixon Library, has got a project that is stupendous. He has interviewed 88 former Nixon types and people that worked around them. He's got a couple hundred hours of programs. He's going to release it next March. We were talking about it this morning. It's the kind of thing that we'll find some room for some of that. People have talked to him that would never talk to a journalist. It's very, very interesting. I'm going to give you one <clears throat> story that indicates where I see the future is going to be. And I'm going to talk about somebody that today at 11 o'clock Washington Times stood up on the Senate floor and said goodbye to his colleagues, a guy named Ted Stevens. Whether you love him or hate him, 
what he has been through, and I went to a lot of the different, uh, during the court, during the, the uh, trial, I sat in the audience just as an observer to watch it, and I kept thinking about what was going on here. And I kept thinking about what has, what, what did television do in the middle of this? Well, to start with, cameras were not allowed in the courtroom in Washington. It was a district court. <clears throat> and that made a big difference as to what the public could see. Outside, every day that the court was there, there were at least four, sometimes six, huge cameras sitting right outside the door of the courtroom all day long, doing nothing but watching Ted Stevens get out of a car and go in and get out of the building and go to the car. The amount of money spent on that was absurd. Absurd. You had at least two people from each network standing there all day long. And that's going to go away, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> that cannot continue. It's a waste of money. Just think what those cameras could have been doing. We'd love to have those six cameras at another hearing room during that day. Then I watched tons of reporters come in, in and out. And they did a good job. A fellow from the Washington Post did a particularly good job there. Nina Totenberg was there from NPR from time to time. The Anchorage Daily News did a superb job. And if you go to their website right now, you'll find everything from the trial, including the videotape of another trial where a guy was found guilty. Had nothing to do with the feds. He's in jail today. He's in prison. We have three former legislators in Alaska in Sheridan, Oregon prison. <clears throat> Story you don't, most of you don't even know about. There's another guy in a prison down in Texas who was a former mayor of Fairbanks, Alaska. There's a couple more going to jail before it's over. And the Anchorage Daily News has every bit of this, and they have video and audio. They have the FBI audio taps on Ted Stevens' conversations with this guy, Bill Allen, who ends up being the culprit at the center who copped a plea and sung on everybody else. That's all on the Anchorage Daily News site, and it's terrific. But here's what's different. I've never met this guy. We're trying to find him. <clears throat> I know he exists. We just haven't talked to him yet. But there's a guy by the name of Cliff Grow. Some of you may know him. You may have heard of him. He's a lawyer from Alaska. He blogged every day of the trial. He did, I think he's a Democrat, but I'm not even sure about that. There's a grow on the website that says that maybe his father was a Republican. It doesn't matter. He may have not even been for Ted Stevens, but I can tell you that he meticulously blogged every day the most fascinating in-depth account of what went on in that courtroom for the entire trial, which lasted over 30 days. You all know 30 years ago that didn't exist. That is growing like crazy. <clears throat> I'm carrying with me a, one of these little Canon... $200 cameras that some of you in this room have already taken pictures with today, I can get an hour of video on that. that that's, everybody knows that. <clears throat> so as the future unfolds, as ratings are haywire, I wrote down this morning, I was checking yesterday in the LA Times where they list 117 programs, and I wrote down a couple of things that I found pretty interesting about the, how the ratings thing has changed. There were 21... Univision programs that were rated better than the worst NBC program. 30 years ago, it, it, it just wouldn't have happened. Here's the, the most interesting statistic, and I may be off, off a point or two. <clears throat> there are 17 programs on that list of 117 that had fewer viewers than the DVR or the digital video recorder version of Grey's Anatomy. Four million plus people had watched Grey's Anatomy last week on the DVR. I can't figure out where it's all going to go. I have no idea. All I know is that in our era, meaning 30 years ago, or in my era plus Jim Loper and Winner's era and others in this room that were involved in public television, there comes out of this people that really, really care about information. I think we're going to be a lot better off than a lot of the people in the business of journalism think. I think it will all settle down. This is a very difficult time right now. Ernie talks about the excitement about Washington. I'm not excited about Washington because I don't get excited about anything in Washington for the simple reason that if you do, as I learned a long time ago, don't fall in love with a politician because they'll break your heart. But if you're in the journalism business, you ought to be falling in love with them anyway. There ought to be a clear-eyed view of this. I don't care how exciting it is, and it is exciting in the, in the, for a lot of people. 
this is a time where you need to look at this stuff with a clear eye because before long, we'll be instead of ten and a half trillion dollars in debt, we'll be fifteen trillion dollars in debt. And no matter how much you love a politician, it's going to affect your life. So. With that as an opening here, I'd love to throw it on. You all have as good a view of all this as I do. So uh, if anybody has a question, I can fill in the blank of our little operation. Or if you've got an observation about the future, Jeff, get out of here. Leave me alone. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Jeff and I, Jeff told me what to do for five years. He was the producer of the morning show. And I, as he said, I was the talent. Oh, that's a stretch. <laughs> Jeff likes to say he was the chef and that he was f providing the food to us so that we could pass it on to the viewers. Anyway, who has an observation or something they'd like to ask? Well, yes? I, I, I could ask a thousand questions, but I'll make one quick statement from a little voice here in Southern California. If our democracy only works by an informed citizenry, I think that you have added more than any other single person in the last 30 years. And I say thank you for all that you've done. And I guess that, that's, that's nice of you to say that, but I got to keep telling people this. I have been able to live my dream. It has taken, and this is the same story with anything like this, it has taken hundreds of others, including people in the business world who never get credit for anything, for staying behind this. We just went through a series of strategic planning meetings where they have basically agreed to fund this thing for the next nine years. Now, that may sound like not a whole lot to you, but in this day and age, and I know people that support public broadcasting have a terrible go with this, this money thing all the time. That's the most interesting good thing about us is that our funding is there all the time. And our industry has basically just re-endorsed this thing for the next nine years. And we're taught, here's the difference. I'm 67, when I started I was 35. My board members are now 45. And it's a whole new generation and they're all MBAs. and they are buying off on this, so that's the good part of this. Did you have a question? Anybody have? Well, I could ask you, do you wish you had Barack Obama's uh, voice in this book now? It's too late. Uh, the book he's talking about is the Abraham Lincoln book, which includes 56 authors. We've taken my questions out, and Susan Swain, who is the co-writer on this, basically does all the genius work, and she took these interviews, and we took the questions out and created narratives so that when you read them, you don't have to listen to my voice. You can just hear the voice of the authors. And um, I, being around, and I, Brother Smiley here has been one of our guests and was in one of our books. Being around authors and people who think like this has been a fabulous thing for a guy. You ought to understand, I come from a little t town, and this is not one of those gee whiz stories. It's a fact. I'm a normal person with not a strange upbringing. My parents were normal. Uh, we lived in a small town. I went to a Midwestern school. I didn't do well with my grades. I wasn't a great scholar. I'm not a scholar today. I'm not a lecturer. I don't give lectures. Uh, and it's, it is, I guess, more than anything else, a reflection of the American way because we've had 50 people in our operation from other lands and when they sit down to talk about they say, tell us about C-SPAN. When we get around to saying there's not a dime's worth of taxpayer money in this, they fall off their chair. And then when they find out that the government people don't have anything to say about what goes on, they can't believe it. Because most of them come from the government when they come in. And they say, oh, that would never work in our country. Well, trust me, it will. Canada does it. They get a, but even in Canada, it's more regulated. We're not regulated at all. Nothing about us is regulated. They sneak in a little bit of regulation on our radio station because it's licensed. But, and we let it rip, which I find very interesting. All this fussing over this language and everything on the other networks and the stories and all that. We have never censored <coughs> on television anything since we started, and we're still standing. I mean, we got through this okay. I don't like the language, but if somebody on our call-in shows calls in and says something... Uh, that is a little off color, it, it's, it floats. Uh, it's, it's not something I want, and we come very close sometimes to say, let's delay this thing. Anyway, I can ramble on about that. Yes, ma'am. we got two of you over here. Hi, Brian. Nancy Snow. Hi, nice Nancy. To see you. 
I know you're going to be at Syracuse very soon. Tavis is coming with me. No problem. Yeah, he'll come. He's... It's a thrill to see Tavis, too. I actually left USC Annenberg and Cal State Fullerton for the Newhouse School, and I'm in the Department of Public Relations. And I was sharing with our table earlier that um, I've been learning about public relations, and in the main textbook that we're using this fall, I came across the, a line that said, in public relations, there's no such thing as the public interest. There's only target publics. And um, I'd like to remind people that public relations is the fastest growing major in many communications schools across the country. Journalism is dying. Many students come in, they aren't interested in public interest journalism. They want jobs, they want high paying jobs, so they go into advertising, PR, entertainment studies. So I really want to revisit this concept of the public interest. Uh, I think now with the excitement around a new president, maybe this will change and there will be more student interest in the public interest. But it seems to be a sort of a collective identity that we're all in this together as opposed to just individual interests or the bottom line. You, you touched on something on, on the journalism thing and uh, journalists won't, probably won't like to hear this, but um, it's been my observation. We've 30 years in business and we cover about 2,000 hours of hearings every year. Members of Congress, Senate and House, are often better questioners than journalists. And when they are mad, as they have been in the last couple of weeks, they rip, like no journalist ever does. And I have seen some fascinating, serious, intelligent questioning going on that Journalists don't do. I know Tavis. When you interview, he's, there's nothing hostile about him. I'm not hostile. We don't. We, but these, when they're back and forth, they can really they get right in there. And you got to give them more credit than that. I think journalists, people. We, we've had all the oh, over the years. We've had all these different ups and downs in this business. Um, somebody, people always wanted to define journalism. I'll tell you what journalism is, in my opinion. Journalism is somebody like me going inside the Ted Stevens trial and coming out and wanting to tell you everything I saw without prejudice, without being for or against him. The entire time I went in there, and my wife Vicki, who's here, she, I even pulled her up there one Sunday night. They had a 6 o'clock hearing. I said, I just want you to see this. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I did, but I don't think I ever indicated to her how I felt, really felt about what was going on inside that room. I did care about the checks and balances, and I saw them working. But it's without prejudice. And there's nothing wrong with opinion. When it's time for the opinion, let it go. But when you're, if you call yourself a, a journalist, put it down. I know, I'm not one of those things that has to go, never imply anything, but put it down so that I can judge myself. There's a lot going on out there in the world. I don't, even, I don't even like the word blogs, but there's a lot going on out there in the world of the internet. It's just spectacular stuff that people are doing. And I think out of that's going to come Especially, I mean, you're, you're training them here at a school like this to do this kind of thing. They're going to do it in different ways, in different, different venues. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Thank you for being here. What was your most surprising moment on Book Notes? Well, the most surprising moment after Book Notes, because I was just being me, and I was... <laughs> I've, it's been reported so many times whenever they talk about book notes is when I ask the question, um, oh God, his name's not coming to me in a minute, of the British, the Churchill um, uh, author, what is buggery? And um, I'll, yeah, I don't know about you, I'll ask anything, you know, and boy, he, he completely, he about fell off his chair. He didn't want to define it. Um, and since then, it co pops up in any story that's ever written. Um, you know, uh, the, for me, interviewing people, the greatest thrill is at the moment they tell me something I don't know about something that I've been thinking about in my life. It, it's affected me a lot and affected our network. I'll give you an example. I kept reading these books. And I go back to the fact that I was a speech student at Purdue. I was not a scholar. I was curious. And I got more and more curious the older I got. And every time I'd read a book and there'd be mention of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. 
And I'd say, you know, okay, the like, it sounds good, whatever that is. And then I would be reading, and, I, and I'd see a reference to Tocqueville. And the, what I noticed right away was that one guy would call him Tocqueville, the other Tocqueville, the next one Tocqueville, the next one De Tocqueville, the next one De Tocqueville, whatever. They, and people didn't seem to really know. They knew that he wrote Democracy in America and all that stuff. The thrill for me along the way was then to turn the Tocqueville thing into a 55 city tour and to go to his chateau in France and sit there and talk to his family and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then with the Lincoln-Douglas debates was to meet a guy like Harold Holzer who has a great impact on C-SPAN because he did the book on Lincoln-Douglas and we did the, the recreation in Illinois back in 1994 where the individual communities actually did it. And then that led to us for what it's, I mean, I don't mean to throw this away, it's not a dramatic thing, but we're the official network of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Celebration. Uh, it means that it can be all Lincoln all the time. It just turns out that it, it's a pretty, pretty good time to do that because the, some guy named Obama seems to like Lincoln and uh, started his campaign there at the old state house. and it goes on and on. The comparisons are significant. The only thing he hasn't done yet is grow a beard. And um, Lincoln grew that beard between the time he was elected and the time he came to Washington, so there's still time. We got Although time he keeps losing his hair. Uh, time for one more question. This is ending too quickly. I'm, I'm sorry we don't have more time. But Jeffrey. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you, you, is this on? Um, you mentioned uh, uh, some of the things the networks are, are doing and have done for years and how they're the same. Uh, and you mentioned uh, one thing that you, you think could be improved upon is you know, stationing camera people outside of courtrooms and just filming people going in and out, that type of thing. You have some pretty interesting um, criticisms of the network news operations and the money they spend. Can you give us some suggestions on how those programs could be improved? No. <laughs> um, it, and I don't mean to be so abrupt about it. It's not my business. Uh, look, those, <laughs> those folks are the, at those networks are living in a world that I don't live in. They have pressures that I don't have. Frankly, if you look at what's happening to their ratings, you wouldn't want to be there. I mean, it, it just, it's just going down all the time. The younger folks are just not going there. You know, I'm 67, as I said, and there are people my age that are watching it. Vicky and I watch it all the time. Frankly, I don't need to because by the time that comes around, I know what's going on in the world. And they will change when they have to, but I think people... And, Brian Williams, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Charlie Gibson I knew years ago when he was a cub radio reporter up on Capitol Hill. Uh, they're doing the best they can in the environment they have, but they can't help it. You know, they had this incredible dominance at a time when there were only three, and actually you can just see that it's like public television had all the dominance in that world, and so much of what public television did in the early days is being done by others. So you got to be a little bit more agile, I think, and, and uh, nimble at this time to survive. We, I see the handwriting on the wall at our place. There are a lot of young people there. And during the convention, something that I could not be less interested in, they asked if, uh, they said they were going to do this, and I've, my attitude is try it. And we had something called the Campaign Hub, and they got themselves involved in something called Twitter, <laughs> you know, which... You have to you, you have to keep your message to 140 characters. I could care less. I'm the guy that sits and watches three hours or eight hours of Tavis Smiley. I don't want Twitter. I don't want somebody observing something in you know 140 characters. So it's going to move on. The only thing we're trying to do, and by the way, let me tell you one anecdote or two. I'll give you these two. This is how it's changing so rapidly. On December the th Second or third, the Congressional Visitor Center opens in Washington, D.C. If you haven't paid attention, uh, you're going to hear a lot about this because what started out as a $230 million project is now, they say, uh, $620 million, but I suspect it's a lot more than that. It will open up, and you're going to see it a lot. We're going to do a lot on it so you can see what it looks like. And when you go there, you're going to be comforted. You'll have plenty of room to move around in, a nice restaurant there and all this kind of stuff. But here's what you're not going to see. 
Underground are 13 control rooms that were built on the Senate side alone. And those control rooms, look at Adam's <laughs> squinting, uh, on, the, on the Senate side alone are 13 control rooms, and one of them will control the, what goes on on the floor of the Senate, which are not our cameras and never have been. The other 12 will be directly related to one of 12 hearing rooms. And in those 12 hearing rooms will be the 12, the cameras that belong to the Senate, high definition, fed into these control rooms. And my suspicion is right to the web. You can see our relevance is becoming less and less. And on the House side, they're going to probably do the same thing. And this has all been done under dark at night. They haven't discussed this out loud with anybody. It's all been part of this big budget. And members of Congress have always wanted to control their own environment. They don't like the fact that we run it all. They'd rather they, it'd be run all by them, uh, entirely by them. And uh, it, it's the nature of the business. The last anecdote was I was down this week on Monday uh, at the, uh, the new American History Museum, remodeled History Museum. Spent $85 million in the place, half of it by the government and half of it by individual uh, private donors. As I'm walking around, and we're, I did a tape show with Brent Glass, who's the director there. It'll be on Sunday night at 5 o'clock out here and 8 o'clock out here on Q&A that I still host. And uh, just talking about what they did differently. And as I'm walking around, I notice there's a lot of lights. And there's these big anvil cases sitting there. And I just said to the PR woman, I said, well, what are these? She said, oh, we're into the new world. I said, what do you mean? She said, we're going to be webcasting all of our activities this week. Meaning their big party last night and their big announcement and Friday's dedication and all that. That is a government, quasi-government institution in Washington. Go right to the web. You know, I could, I could envision the time when they'll stop calling us. And they'll say, they'll have their, like Barack Obama's got supposedly 10 million names on that he can address. He'll just say, and he's already started it in the interim period. He's not doing a radio address on Saturday. He's doing an address on Saturday, and he's videotaping it and putting it on the web right now. That's what he'll do in the future. And those 10 million will just get a little email that says, here it is. So it's a changing world that we better all wake up and smell the coffee uh, or uh, what? I, I guess I'll be back in Lafayette drinking tap water. Uh, <laughs> thank you all very much. Uh, Don't leave there, Brian. If you haven't had enough of Brian Lamb, who thought this was too short, I want to say he's going to be in my class at 4 o'clock in the auditorium at the Annenberg School. So if you want to act like your students again, as we all just were, please join me for that. Uh, Brian, this was fabulous. Tavis, you were wonderful to make this introduction. And Ernie and I have a little uh, gift for you. Naturally, it's Baum's show, so. Money. I want to catch up with Katie. Here it is. Oh. Very. Uh, and we also uh, have outside uh, for people to, to buy the books that, uh, that you nicely held up, the Lincoln book, uh, and I know that we will all be watching you uh, tonight or ne next week, weeks to come. And I just want to say personally, one of the great things you did that wasn't talked about enough was the book, the book channel, book TV. It's amazing how that has revolutionized all of our lives. So, Brian, on behalf of a grateful nation, thank you so much. Thank you.